Hi, Dominic Steele here, coming to you from Oxford in England. When Henry VIII died, his nine-year-old son Edward took the throne. Edward was only on the throne for five and a half years, but what a five and a half years of monumental change. As Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer required all England's churches to use a common prayer book and first time, church services would not be conducted in Latin, but in English. Let me encourage you to do our Ideas That Change the World series, looking at the four big Reformation ideas, grace, faith, Bible, Christ, and four great reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, William Tyndale, and Thomas Cranmer. It's called Ideas That Change the World. This is Dominic Steele in a special edition of The Pastor's Heart today. We're talking to the two leaders of the GAFCON movement, the movement representing 50 million out of the world's 70 million Anglican Christians. So Archbishop Ben Kwashi, the new General Secretary of GAFCON from Jos in Nigeria, and Archbishop Foley Beach, the Chair of the Primates Council of the GAFCON movement. They'll be here to talk to us about decisions made at a meeting this last week in Sydney. Before we get to them, though... To let you know what's coming up, next week we talk to Jay Bean. He's an Anglican minister from New Zealand, and he and a number of other churches in New Zealand have found it necessary over the last little while to break away from the main denomination, as the main denomination, really, they've moved into false teaching, on the tragically, on the area of sexuality. And uh, Jay and uh, a number of his colleagues and peers and their congregations have chosen to walk away from their homes and buildings and uh, it's a tremendously important story to hear next week on The Pastor's Heart. Uh, after that, we'll be talking to Richard Chin about the journey that God has led him on in 25 years of Christian ministry. Richard, of course, the General Secretary of the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students. David and Kathy Thurston will be here to talk about uh, how ministers function in the inner life, uh, mentoring that whole area. We're going to be talking to David Jones about... Uh, his great work of um, and learning lessons from, well, five church plants that he's been involved in and two church revitalizations, and we're talking to the Archbishop of Rwanda, Laurent Mabunda, and the story from barefoot to bishop. It'd be great if you could subscribe to the Pastor's Heart. You can do that at our website, thepastorsheart.net. Uh, you could subscribe on the YouTube or on podcast on the Android on the Apple or on the Spotify, and uh, we'd love you to do that. Uh, now, to GAFCON and to the leaders of GAFCON, Ben Quashie and Foley Beach. Foley Beach and Ben Quashie, welcome to the Pastor's Heart. Now, as new leaders of the GAFCON movement, which really has affiliated with it 50 million of the 70 million Anglicans in the world, uh, we, I thought we might just start by asking you, and perhaps you first, Foley, just to share a little of your heart and a journey that God has walked you through. Well, first of all, thanks for having us and a real joy to be here. I think for me, uh, uh, I'm on an adventure with the Lord and um, I keep saying, Lord, are you sure you want me doing this? Uh, me, of all people? Um, and so it's, it's stunning to be in this role for me personally. But on another note, I see so many of God's people hungry for the clear teaching of Scripture. I see so many people um, being deceived by what we would, what the Bible calls false teachers, teaching another gospel, and, and my heart breaks because it's leading them into bondage. Uh, rather than the, the gospel ought to be leading people out of bondage, but it, but the teachings lead them into bondage. Um, and then I see a world where there's 2.1 billion people that have no opportunity to hear about Jesus. There's no church reaching out to them. There's no organization or mission agency that's trying to t touch them. And, and they're, they're dying without Jesus Christ, without even being able to hear about Him. And so I see this GAFCON movement as an opportunity to reach the people of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also those in the church who are being led astray to say, no, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible teaches and, 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 sh and teach and share. So that's a little of my heart of, of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah. What about you, Ben? What, what's... What's going on in my heart is a lot of um, 
I don't know how to put it, but I have this pain that I'm getting old <laughs> <laughs> and accomplished very little. Mm. That's what's paining me. It's paining me because in the last 40 years of preaching the gospel, in the small areas that I have served, I have seen Jesus do wonders, literally. I've seen congregations um, turn around from from knowing nothing about how to survive to becoming people who are self-sufficient through the preaching and teaching of the gospel. I, I believe very strongly, and there's nothing that will change me from this, that God blesses honesty. God blesses righteousness. God blesses justice. But God does not bless sin, doesn't bless iniquity. And I've been teaching this to our people. So yes, Nigeria might be corrupt and all of that, but people who practice this have seen how God blesses their areas. Mm. Now, I, I'm, I wish I could divide myself in so many places so that I can take this gospel mm. everywhere. Mm. Mm. And, and that's, that's what's, I said, Lord, please. But the second thing that's going in my mind, and I think I shared this with Foley yesterday, is here we are in Australia, and we're 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 fairly comfortable. Mm. How did the apostles and the, the people of old? How did they manage with no electricity, mm. no safety on the roads, mm. no guarantee of journeys? Yet they were this effective. And it's recorded in secular history that they were troublemakers and they turned the whole world mm. upside so down. down. And we're here so comfortable and the world is comfortable. Mm. It, 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 it aches me. Mm. It's going on. That's what's chewing me right now. Mm. Now, you've just come from the meeting of the GAFCON Primates Council. Mm. Um, the 11 primates who make up that council... Well, there were 11 here this time. There are others that participate, but for various reasons couldn't make it. Right. And, uh, I mean, well, firstly, what is a primates council, Foley? <laughs> well, first of all, what's a primate? Yes. That's probably a good question. <laughs> um, I was asked that yesterday. Um, a primate is the archbishop that's over a province. Mm -hmm. Now, some provinces have more than one archbishop, so you just can't say it's the archbishop. It's the archbishop that has been, and it's usually elected by the bishops uh, to serve as the, as the, the lead bishop in a province, mm -hmm. and that's called the primate. So this group of 11, or, and there's more affiliated with GAFCON, uh, that's 11 out of the 40 primates in the Anglican Communion, but representing two-thirds or 70% of the Anglicans globally. So we're talking about a very significant gathering. And, I mean, I got to speak to a few of them during the week, and I just came away thinking, wow, these are such wise and godly men, um, men of substance. You know, And I, I found my little interactions, and I wasn't in the room where you were making decisions, but enormously encouraging in Christ. I imagine that's similar feelings for yourselves? Yeah. Yes, and let me just say one thing. Um, we're talking about active Anglicans mm -hmm. because, you know, you got roll numbers on a book, but those that, that it turn up in church every mm -hmm. Sunday uh, is the vast majority of Anglicans in the world. These men are incredible men of God. Uh, their stand for the gospel, their knowledge of the truth, their theological depth, and the struggles that they have to face every day in their own worlds. Uh, it's a privilege to, to serve with mm. these guys and to be with these guys. So, yes, you're right. They're, it's an unusual uh, group of men. But these are men who most of them have paid a serious price to stand for the gospel, and they're willing to uh, do what they can to, to, to proclamate uh, the word of Jesus Christ no matter where they are. And, um, and that's why we see in our beloved communion when those other folks in, in the in leadership decide that, no, the Bible is not important. The teaching of Scripture, whether it's theology or morality, is no longer appropriate. Uh, we've got to speak out. Mm. We've got to speak up. Mm. And these men are, <laughs> are great. One of the encouragements to me was just feeling, as, as we look at <laughs> the, the things coming out of the communique from this week, from this Primates Council, is just the the quiet sense of getting on with the business of preaching Christ and bringing God's God glory. Perhaps you could share some of those those kind of exciting stories that were part of the part of the week for you. Yeah. Well, you know, it it is true. We want to get on with the the, the work of the gospel and doing the work of the church. The problem is the church, the the established church, keeps throwing it in our face. Mm. 
and we're having to, to deal with it. Mm. We'd rather just put both hands to the plow and, and get on with mm. it. But because we're shepherds, we, we have to answer. And so that's why we have to deal with some of these issues. But we did a lot. First, we, uh, we agreed to a new diocese, an ex-provincial diocese for New Zealand. Now, this is exciting. Let, and actually, we should say next week on The Pastor's Heart, we're going to talk to JB and key figure in that, in that movement. But for those who don't know, tell us what's happened in New Zealand. Well, of course, New, the, the official church in New Zealand changed their marriage doctrine. And, and a number of folks said, wait a minute, this is no longer Christian teaching. Um, and they, are, well, they weren't willing to, to change. And so they said, we can't be under leaders that are teaching this. So um, they appealed to us to offer help, and, and we have. And so we have... A, and excitingly, this, the GAFCON network of lawyers has been a, a player in this. Do you want to just... What's that? Well, that's a group of... Uh, it is lawyers when you get all the jokes about that. But but really, these are godly men mm. who, who know the law and, and basically help them frame their constitution. Yeah, who knows how to write a constitution? Well, actually, <laughs> exactly. you're one of the few people in the world I know who knows something about this. Well, it's, it's, I want to stay out of it. I'm, I just <laughs> I want to preach the gospel. But you have to have legal structures and you have to be able to operate within the, the, the laws of your own country. And so that's what the Lawyers Network helped them do. So they've established the Constitution. We approved and, and, and gave our bless. Approve is maybe not the right word. We gave our blessing for them to, uh, to move forward. And so they're going to have a, a synod coming up in a few weeks where they will vote to uh, accept their Constitution or not. And then the other piece of that is if they accept their Constitution, then they will vote to elect a new bishop. And uh, the uh, GAFCON primates agreed that we would support that bishop. Uh, we would be in full communion with the new diocese and, uh, and the bishop um, himself. And uh, we have even uh, have a consecration date uh, that we've agreed upon if they elect a bishop. Right. And I understand from Glenn Davies from Sydney and you're going to be going to the, uh, yes. To the consecration? Yeah. Yes. And, um, and uh, I, I understand a number of bishops from Australia and then there'll be folks from around the world. Um, that will also be attending that. Why is this controversial? That's a great question. Ben, you want to? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's got to be controversial because it would seem to me that in some parts of the Anglican <clears throat> world right now, if you're taking a stand mm -hmm. for the authority of the Bible, you're considered uh, so. I mean, you're called me. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're considered mm -hmm. to, to, to some extent. They say you're not. You're no longer an Anglican. Mm -hmm. So that is the first part. The second part is that when you have taken on to love the church that has become the vehicle through which we are saved and we as we serve and we 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 adore, mm. but you can see that that vehicle is being um, mismanaged or is being. Is, is taken in the wrong direction. Well, well, clearly false teaching in New Zealand's case. Yeah. And you're saying, no, 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 that's not the direction to go. That there are only two, well, one or two options. They kick you out or you're forced to leave. Mm -hmm. So in this case, they were forced to leave mm. because they couldn't stand together again with this false teaching. So that is following in no news because it's happened in America. It, 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 it's happening in Canada and now New Zealand. Mm. And I suspect most likely it's going to go on around the world. Mm. It's interesting. When I was growing up and younger, I was in college days, someone who was more liberal was someone who honored people who stood by their conscience. Mm -hmm. You know, that were people, and, and that great respect for that. Well, we now live in a time where those in power, ecclesiastical power, if you're trying to stand by your conscience, you're called names, you're ostracized, you're even kicked out of the church, or you're told you're not part of the church. Mm. And um, and these good people, and they are good people in New Zealand. Well, I mean, uh, JB, and uh, such an impressive man. Such a, a tremendous man of God, yes. Mm. And and the folks around him, I was uh, blessed to be with them last weekend. Yeah. And... Um, uh, really have a heart for mission and heart to, to serve Jesus Christ. Can we come now to the Lambeth Conference? And um, uh, we saw just a week and a half ago um, the invitation, uh, really, well, 
GAFCON Jerusalem 2018 put out a very clear statement, um, a very clear statement saying, calling for repentance on the false teaching um, and, uh, and, and urging Christians, if the Anglican Communion would not repent on that issue, not to take part in the, in the, in the, the Lambeth Conference. Um, uh, it's been radio silence publicly for nine months until a week and a half ago. Um, how do you feel as leaders of the GAFCON movement about that nine months of silence when um, two thirds of the world's Anglicans asked for a response? Well, I find it very strange uh, that Archbishop Justin, uh, first of all, wasn't even, didn't even greet the conference, mm -hmm. actually. Here you've got 2,000 leaders yeah. <laughs> in the Anglican world, the largest gathering in over 50 years, and, and there's silence. Mm -hmm. Then uh, they issued, I say they, I was part of it, we issued a very polite, uh, respectful challenge uh, that he abide by Lambeth 110. Mm that he invite folks that have agreed and been practicing Lambeth 110, and that he not invite folks that have defied it. This is the official teaching of the, of the Anglican Communion on uh, sexual ethics. And um, so then this past week, uh, well, actually in the past few weeks, we, we've been hearing that, uh, that he basically has not abided by what we asked him to do, that he actually himself is not abiding by Lambeth 110 by inviting those who uh, are, are married to same-sex uh, partners uh, to the conference. So that's very challenging. Yeah. What do, we, what do you do with that? What, 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 what do people of God do with that when the Scripture is so clear about your... Uh, uh, it's so clear if you go through the New Testament and, and really study... Yes. Yeah, yeah yes. That's, that's the most painful one. That's the most painful. And I think this is where I think that the Gafcon primates have my my great admiration because they have a respect for the millions of people they lead mm. and they realize that if they made a wrong decision the number of people that would perish because of their wrong decision mm. is enormous mm. now the weight of that responsibility will not allow them to be flippant or careless about taking a stand. Mm. If at the end of the day we stood for the scriptures and we were proved wrong when Jesus appears, we can have a case. But knowing full well that Jesus died and rose and that the power of salvation is real and the testimony is beyond millions of lives who testify now in our generation to the living Jesus, how can we deny such a great salvation? And these primates consider that. And that's why they win my admiration tremendously. Mm. Secondly, because of the truth of that salvation, we are not just rejoicing that we are the saved ones. No, no, no. We have a responsibility to make sure that others who have not heard this gospel are given an opportunity to hear the gospel. So we have a huge responsibility on our salvation to take this message out to other people and we are going to take it at costs and many people have done so at the cost of their lives mm. they have died on the way they have been killed by the people who would not listen to them and all of that but all of that is worth it when you know that at the end of the whole exercise jesus is standing there mm. and according to hebrews He's receiving all these people mm. for whom the world they were not the world is not worthy of them. Mm. That's a reality. Yeah. At Jerusalem last year, when I spoke to Rico Tice, and he just resigned from the Archbishop of Canterbury's Evangelism Committee, he said he needed to resign because the chairman of the committee held a different religion. It's a different religion. Bishop Paul Bays and I have a different religion. And it's around whether um, uh, scripture is authoritative in terms of human sexuality. But my view, I, I think it's a great wickedness to tell people who are on the road to destruction that they're not. To tell them that they are safe when it comes to God's wrath when they're not. And the road to destruction in Britain is defined by two things, tolerance and permissiveness. You can do what you please and you can think what you please. 
Now, if, if, if we have church leaders that are putting people on that road to destruction, it's a salvation issue. And that's why we have to distance ourselves. That's why I stepped down from the Archbishop's Commission, which I may say was grievous. I wept about it because I was longing to serve and found it a great honor that Archbishop Welby had appointed me to that. And then I was having to submit to the leadership of a man who is contrary to scripture. So it was agony. I'm, I'm not, I, you know, in, in a way I, I come to GAFCOM partly grieving, but also delighted to find a family that is Anglican and that I can trust to submit to the Lord Jesus in Scripture. He said he needed to resign because the chairman of the committee held a different religion. Because he said the chairman of the committee is saying it's safe to walk on a path that Rico felt was leading to destruction. Um, would you go as far as saying when the Archbishop of Canterbury has endorsed this practice by inviting same-sex partners to Lambeth, that he's holding a different religion. No, I wouldn't go that far. I, I couldn't say that. I have deep respect for Archbishop Justin. Um, like, Actually, I like him a lot, and I, I think he's got a genuine faith. And I really think he's, um, he's trying to bring everybody together, but you bring people together by having a strong center not by bringing together, trying to, the polars, if you focus on the, the polarities, you're, you're not going to have the center. You have to have the center and then those from the center. And I think what he, he has attempted to do is to placate um, those who uh, advocate for this kind of thing. And the GAFCON primates have said, wait a minute, this isn't scriptural. Mm. This isn't the teaching of the communion. This isn't what we all agreed upon. And so it puts them in a real, real tough spot. And I admire their courage. I admire their willingness to speak out in love. Um, you know, it really gets back you know, to what Archbishop Ben was saying. It gets back to Genesis chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Did God really say that? Did God really say that? And that's the root of it all. Mm. We've, we've left the word of God, his clear instruction. Mm. And been deceived. Yeah. yeah. So what's the response of the Primates Committee today? Well, we have uh, sent a, a, a letter to Archbishop Justin <clears throat> um, reminding him of the, the letter from Jerusalem, the letter to the churches. And uh, we've asked him to respond on some certain, certain things. And at this point, I want to keep the detail of that letter uh, quiet. And we're, we're going to wait for his response. Since he didn't give us an official response from the letter to the churches, uh, we're hoping he will respond to this letter. In the meantime, though, you've set up another conference in 2020 in Africa for bishops. Could you tell us about that? Um, sure, we have set up, uh, the primates thought it was uh, uh, really prudent uh, for those who by conscience feel like they can't go to La Lambeth for them uh, to be deprived of having a gathering for themselves. Um, so we're going to have a gathering uh, in Kigali, Rwanda, uh, early next June. The Switzerland of Africa. The Switzerland of Africa. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> All the hills. Um, uh, hosted by uh, the Church of Rwanda. And uh, uh, it'll be open to all GAFCON bishops who can sign the Jerusalem Declaration, but especially geared to the, for those who by conscience feel like they cannot attend Lambeth. And uh, there'll be good training, good teaching, good worship, good fellowship, and uh, hopefully, um, uh, how should I say it, a, a collegiality of, of what it means to be a part of a larger fellowship of bishops that hold the biblical truth and uh, serious about proclaiming Jesus to the nations. That sounds exciting to me. Do you know, I mean, it, it, that, that sounds like something that's going to be really, really encouraging in Christ. It's very exciting. I was making the joke that the bishops around Congo and Uganda and and some parts of Kenya will just start walking down to Kigali. <laughs> yeah, actually, he was worried about when it would start so they would know how long, how many days to, to trek off. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's um, oh, how should I say it? We're about renewing and reforming the Anglican communion. Mm -hmm. We don't want to divide it. 
We don't want to, to see it destroyed. We want to see it hurt. But we want, we want to see it flourish. And the only way that's going to happen is when Jesus Christ is honored and his truth is Amen. exalted. Amen. Mm. And uh, mm. so we want to give bishops a way to do that, mm. um, to bring reformation and, and, and good uh, renewal to their own diocese. Uh, so we'll see what happens. And just to go through some, some of the things that, are, that jumped out at me as being particularly encouraging, since June last year, the establishment of these networks and, um, and seeing them start to function and the Bishop's Training Institute. Well, well just tell me what's happening with that, because that's pretty exciting. <laughs> I think that they've taken off. Um, I, I know that Gloria is <coughs> just jumping and getting in touch with all the leaders, mm -hmm. women leaders around the world mm -hmm. about this. Um, it's the women's, women's network. Women's network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they've agreed to to the fact that it's going to be a, 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 a women's network that's that's going to take on everything that has to do with women. And if mm -hmm. you look at what's happening to women, especially in, in, in the South, mm -hmm. you, you see that there's every abuse is on women and women suffer the consequences of war with their children and with the difficulties of life. So I think the church has a huge role to play, not just in a social work, but in a holistic manner, providing those things that will last forever, spiritual, physical, and uh, material as much as possible. So in our own part as women, I see myself as, you know, working uh, to bring together those leaders to take up their responsibility as leaders. And also for us to see how, because we're different in different areas, there are different problems, different needs, and different ways of doing things. So if those leaders in their different areas are convinced that they are the leaders and that they should take up the responsibility to see how people will understand what we're doing right to the grassroots. In, 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 in my experience of working with Gloria, she's the evangelist. Mm. If, if, she, if she comes back some evening, she said, Ben, you know, there's this woman and that woman and the other woman and such and such and such. These are the problems they have. And I said, Gloria, I mean, what takes you out bringing liabilities to me? <laughs> but you know, that's the mission. The yeah. mission is liabilities. So I try to solve those problems for Gloria with five women. Guess what? The church has grown by 35 people because each woman comes with four or five children. Yes. So it's an exciting venture. I mean, I'm no longer afraid of liabilities because that's where my blessings reside. <laughs> so that's the one. The theological part is a big one because I think that the, the books that are teaching against scripture are obsolete. They are useless. They have no use anymore because they are not helping people build faith. They are destroying faith. Mm -hmm. So the theological network has a huge responsibility in that regard in providing um, materials that are going to build people's faith. Why not? The Bible doesn't talk about destroying faith. It talks about building the faith and building the body of Christ. And, and, and the, the one that's very dear to my heart is the youth network. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh boy, I'm looking forward to working with them in the next few uh, months to look ahead at the future. Because if you look at those of us who are leading it now, the young people are excited, by the way, about the leadership now around yes. the world. They're finding something that's giving them meaning, something they can live for, something that excites them, something that's, that's driving them into mission, something that's driving them to adventure. The young people want to go to these suffering places and possibly die even. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to, to motivate, to mobilize, and to build the Great Commission into these young people in the next 12 months, we're going to see a huge movement again of God like it happened in 1901 from Europe to the rest of the world. So th 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 that's, that's some of those networks that uh, I'm very excited about. Mm. Amen. Amen. What are you looking forward to, Polly? Well, I think one of the things that, that, that we're attempting to do is, is the laity is, is the church. Mm -hmm. And we just can't have a bunch of bishops doing stuff. It's, it's not going to go anywhere. But if we can empower the laity to fulfill their ministries, then it will explode. Yeah. And, and we as Anglicans haven't been good at doing that. And so that's what par all these networks are really all about, is empowering the lay people to use their gifts and also to minister to people in ways that are effective and helpful uh, and can it expand the gospel. Mm 
uh, throughout the world. Thanks very much for coming and talking to us. Welcome. Foley Beach and Ben Quashie have been my guests today on The Pastor's Heart. And of course, Foley is the uh, chairman of the GAFCON movement and, uh, and the primate of the Anglican Church of North America. And Ben Quashie has, is the general secretary of the new general secretary of GAFCON and, uh, and the Archbishop of Jos in northern Nigeria.